Aloha, friends, and welcome to a very special interview I have with the beautiful Dr. Amy Horniman. I'm so excited because she's going to teach us everything about thyroid that we had no idea about, um, and maybe like some of the symptoms you're experiencing. She has probably the answers for you because, wow, you like blew my mind with all the stuff that I've been listening to. Um, but Dr. Amy, why don't you tell us first, like, how did you get so interested in the thyroid? Hi, Maria. Thank you for having me. And yeah, I mean, it like so many of us, right, it starts with this pain to purpose story where we go through something and then we're like, hey, this is really important. Other people should should get help in this area. So if we rewind 20 some years, I was competing in figure competitions. I was doing fitness modeling. So I had done that whole diet down, you know, chicken, broccoli, asparagus. You hit the gym twice a day. And I knew how my body was supposed to respond. This one show I was getting ready for, it was a really big show. You know, I was working with a coach. I kept stepping on the scale and I had to report back to him and send him before and after pictures. And the scale kept going up and the pictures kept getting bigger, not smaller. So, you know, I, I, I at first I, I started the self blame game. Like, ah, you know, maybe it's me. Maybe I need to eat less, exercise more, hit the gym three times a day, restrict my calories. And I started to do that and it didn't work. The scale kept going up. Now, when I say up, I mean 25 plus pounds in a very short amount of time, like a month or two. So it's almost like my body had just completely shifted gears, was rebelling against me. And I had no idea, no answers as to why. So I started going to doctors because that's what we do when there's something wrong with us. You know, we go to our doc, we're like, hey, doc, here's what's going on. And they, you know, whatever they tested at the time, I would love to know. I mean, I have a pretty good guess based on what I see with my patients, but they told me I was normal. I, ah, you're normal. Everything is fine. So I didn't feel normal. Didn't feel fine. So I kept going second opinion time. So I went to doctor number two. <laughs> and he tells me, oh, yeah, you're normal. Everything's fine. Just eat less and exercise more. I was like, um, yeah, that's not possible. And Maria, I, I, I kid you not, I was walking in with my diet and exercise regimen. I was handing it to these doctors like, this is what I'm doing. I know you think I'm sitting around eating donuts and bonbons. But this is what I'm really doing. This is what's going into my body. And this is what's happening to my body. So I kept going. I went to a total of six different doctors. They all told me the typical medical gaslighting terms. You're normal. You're fine. It's all in your head. Eat less, exercise more. All of it. I heard all of it. One doc pointed to a BMI chart. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I there were so many times. I mean, I was I was depressed. I would cry in my car. I would leave at a, a doctor's appointment and get in my car and just put my head on the steering wheel and pray to God that there was some kind of diagnosis. There was some, I would have taken anything at that. You point. want answers. I just want an answer. I really did. I would have taken anything. So finally, the seventh doctor, she touches my throat. This is the first doctor to lay hands on me, touches my throat and says, swallow. And she goes, oh, I'm feeling, I'm feeling something on your thyroid. We're going to get an ultrasound, but you know, based on the labs that you did, I'm going to, I'm going to put you, you have hypothyroidism. I'm going to put you on a pill. So I left her office. I was pumped up. I'm like, I have an answer yep. and I have a pill and things are going to change. So I gave it five months mm -hmm. and they didn't change. And looking back, I now know she put me on T4, T4 only, Synthroid Levo, never works, never works in and of itself. You need T3 in the mix. And when I was doing my own doctor Googling, I found, you know, this active thyroid hormone T3 and I learned about T2 and I, I went back to her and I'm like, there's all these other thyroid hormones. What if we use that? And she goes, that's not standard of care. So I don't do that. And I said, well, I'm going to find somebody who does. Yeah. And that's what led me into functional medicine. I kept hearing the name of the same functional medicine practitioner back then. I mean, he's retired since. But this man saved my life and became my mentor. Mm -hmm. And that's what made me completely shift careers and, and go into specializing in thyroid and hormones because I was in a major medical system at that time. I wasn't in a little podunk town. 
I was in like your, what, what's equivalent to Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic. I was in a major system with the best doctors, right? And seven of them failed me. So I knew that, that functional medicine was the answer even way back then. I don't even think it was called functional. It was integrative, alternative. That was the answer because I wanted, I needed someone to look at me as a whole person. And, and this man spent 90 minutes with me the very first time yeah. we met. All the other doctors, five to seven minute visit, you're kicked out the door. And that's what really changed my life. Aloha friends. Are you a carnivore like our carnivore friend over here? Well, if you are, or if you just started out, you might notice that you have low energy, even low moods, heavy legs walking upstairs. And what that means is that carbohydrates retain water. And when you eliminate all those carbohydrates, along goes all that water loss. You might get migraines, headaches. And what you need to do is you can't just drink more water because you're just going to urinate more. You need to add in something like Element. Element is a perfect electro electrolyte that has the best amount of sodium, potassium, and magnesium ratio. And they are so generous if you use code, or actually if you go to drinkelement.com slash ketomaria, you get a free sample with your order. I love it. We always pack it when we come on safari or any of our trips and it tastes delicious. I love this orange salt and I actually marinate chicken with it. It's super delicious. Don't, oh, check that out. How cool is that? Don't miss the free sample. It's awesome. Um, Kai loves the grapefruit salt. Oh, we have, we have more animals coming up. It's pretty cool, huh? Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Don't check, don't miss the free sample. It's awesome. Well, that's amazing. I, I knew that story, but that's, I just love it because it's just so, it's so sad, but I have to tell you, whenever I get clients giving me their labs, it's TSH. Yeah. And I'm like, well, that tells me nothing. Right. Right. And then also when they do have, when they're on a medication like levothyroxine or something, I said, have you ever been diagnosed with Hashimoto's or an autoimmune thyroid? And they're like, no. I was like, how long have you been on the medication? Like 20 years. <laughs> like they've never tested your antibodies. I know. I know. I see that too. I see it all the time. That's well, what are some symptoms that someone might experience if they do have a low thyroid? Well, definitely the rapid weight gain or just weight gain that you can't stop and you can't, you can't lose the weight. You can't stop the gain and you can't lose no matter what you do. I mean, you could be doing keto carnivore, AIP, you know, hitting the gym twice a day, like I was mm -hmm. managing your stress, all the things. And that weight just keeps coming on and won't come off fatigue, hair loss, constipation, depression, anxiety, joint pain, um, loss of the outer corner of your eyebrows, cold intolerance, heat intolerance, insomnia, low libido, because it starts affecting your hormones, cycle irregularities. I mean, the list really goes on and on since the thyroid is the master gland. It's controlling everything in your body. That is another question I had. Does the thyroid affect other hormones and how can that be detrimental? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, it really sits at the top. So if you think of, of the thyroid sitting at the top and everything else underneath it, that's the perfect way to picture how your body runs. Yeah. So your heart rate, your, again, digestion, so slowed gastric motility, i.e. constipation occurs when the thyroid is off. And then we have all the sex hormones down below. We have insulin and glucose regulation down below. We have leptin. That's being controlled by the thyroid. Everything, everything is being controlled by the thyroid, including your brain. So even your mood, that's where we see depression, anxiety. We'll see individuals misdiagnosed bipolar, mm -hmm. misdiagnosed with, you know, the depressive disorder. I mean, just all the things. And they're given the Band-Aid medications for that when it's really the thyroid. Yeah, I have a dear close family member that suffers with that ups and downs and thyroid is up and then it's down and it can't ever like level out. But again, like the doctors aren't giving her answers. Right. So that's why I was like, Oh, you have to have you on. Um, I had some questions from my coaches and one of them was, um, why doesn't anyone address T2? It was so beneficial for me. And I hadn't heard until I heard you talk about it at hack your health. That was from Carrie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, a couple of things. Number one, T2 has been studied for over 30 years. We have over 30 years of research, but because 
it's in supplemental form mm -hmm. and it is not a pharmaceutical. Mm -hmm. You know, let's do the follow the money trail on that one. There's no one, there's no big pharma to benefit. So doctors are not informed and educated on T2 because there's not a prescription pad for it because you can buy it over the counter because it is in supplemental form. So if they can't write for it, then they're not going to tell you about it. Yeah. And if they can't test for it. Now we have T2 assays for the studies that were done, but we don't have that at, you know, LabCorp and Quest, at least oh. not right now. Okay. So, but the problem is that if we start to see it pop up at LabCorp and Quest, that means the pharmaceutical industry has most likely, likely gotten hold of it. And now you're going to have to beg your doctor for a prescription for T2, just like you have to beg your doctor for a prescription for T3. Mm -hmm. So the hope is that it stays accessible mm -hmm. and that it stays out of big pharma's hands. And that way it can be available for, you know, like your coach, Mar or your coach, uh, Carrie, that obviously is noticing the benefits of it. So we, we really do want to want to keep it in the public's reach. Mm -hmm. But to your point and to Carrie's point, it, it's so beneficial. It increases your base of metabolic rate. It doesn't affect your thyroid lab value. So your doctor's not going to think that you're hyper. It doesn't make you anxious. It doesn't affect your heart rate. It just literally works at burning adipose tissue, at turning the white squishy fat brown, which is what we want, and increasing the amount of fat and calories that you're burning at rest. Okay, so now that everybody's ears perked up, <laughs> you have something called Thyroid Fixer, which has T2 in it, right? Right, and right. They, I'll have that link below, it's on your website. Um, but yeah, I've talked to a lot of people that started that and just felt so much better. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I've been researching it for 15 years and using it with my patient population, but it was, Back then, it was only available in supplemental form from like, you know, those angry like bodybuilding company, you know, where it's like it has like a mean like gorilla on the on the, on the front of the bottle. It's yeah. really hard to tell a 40 year old woman right. in perimenopause to go buy this angry product. Right. So and it had caffeine in it and I didn't like that. Cool. So I reformulated. I knew that that T2 was 3,5 diatoyl thyronine. I had done the research. I had do dove deep into the studies. I had used it anecdotally in my patient population. And so when it came time to, to formulate, I knew exactly what I wanted yeah. in thyroid fixer that would be beneficial because I'd already been using it. Yeah, because you have like so tyrosine. That's how that was born, born. Like tyrosine is in there, I think. Mm -hmm. Yep. Very supportive for the thyroid. Absolutely. Oh, yep. Or something for scleen. Col yeah. Yeah. Coleus for Scoli really does work very well on the metabolism and on, on even regulating glucose and insulin. It's a kind of one of those old school uh, ingredients that you don't really hear much about, but it, 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 when you look at the research on that, I mean, it's, it's very mm -hmm. powerful. Well, that's, and you have something called um, metabolic fixer. Me yeah. Metabolism fixer. So that has T2 in it as well. Okay. But what I did is I, well, number one, I made it into a powder because a lot of people don't like taking capsules. So we wanted to give them the, the option to get T2 in powder form. It tastes like tang when you throw it in your water, but it also has suppressa in it. And suppressa, you know, we have this big like thing now with the GLPs and suppressing your appetite and food noise. And we, everybody's talking about food noise. And I mean, it, it's a real thing, right? It, it, cravings and that food noise is a real thing. But by adding suppressa in it, we're getting that suppression of appetite, that controlling of cravings without yeah. completely wiping out our appetite like the GLPs are doing. Yeah. So it, it still is helping people with that food noise without, you know, the, the side effects that come with the GLPs. Well, that's what I think is such an issue, you know, how it makes, I talk to many people, it makes them nauseous. And then mm -hmm. the last thing you want to eat is protein. Makes right. Eat, right. Right. So you need something like that where the hunger isn't. Yeah. I love that idea. Yeah. Just take the edge off, but not, you don't want to completely kill your appetite where you, you literally, and and believe me, I experimented on myself yeah. with VLPs and it is wild where you look at this big, beautiful ribeye and you take two bites and you're like, I literally just can't. Oh. And that's the way to live. Like you're like you said, Marie, you're not gonna get your protein intake taking mm -hmm. two bites of steak. No, no. So yeah. Yeah. 
what are the ideal or optimal levels for thyroid? And I know that's the labs that you see at a lab as sick people, and maybe we can expand on that. Yeah, yeah. The standard lab value range is classic. So those standard lab value ranges that you see on your labs were taken from, like you said, groups of sick people. So they're very, very generalized. I mean, it, it, I mean, just go to Walmart or an amusement park these days, and I mean that's a perfect that's a perfect way to see what our population looks like. And ninety nine percent are obese mm -hmm. and sick and have some kind of disease. So when we take when we test those people, we're going to get this wide, vast uh, range for the labs. Whereas functional medicine comes in. And we're looking at the badasses. We're looking at the fit people. We're looking at the healthy people. We're looking at the 60 and 70 year olds that are still skiing down mountains, right? And we're testing them. And that's where we get a much more narrow range, but it's the optimal range. It's where we know if you fall into the optimal range, there's a really good chance that you are going to feel your best and be your healthiest version of yourself. So for thyroid, you know, TSH has been debated for decades. It actually used to have a much broader range, but it still is too broad according to functional medicine. So for TSH, we want that actually below it too, because TSH is the one value where high means low, meaning the higher that number is, the lower and more hypo you are with your thyroid. So your, your thyroid gland is not functioning very well as TSH goes up. So we really like TSH to be below a two. And then we absolutely have to test free T3, which is your active thyroid hormone. We want that in the upper quadrant of the range. So you can take that standard lab value range that's wide and vast, cut mm -hmm. it into four, and you want to be in that upper quadrant of the range. So don't let your doctor tell you that you're normal. I'm using air quotes here if you're listening. Normal. Don't let them say yeah. that you're normal because normal, you could be, I have seen patients come to me and they are 0.1 point Ooh. above being flagged low yeah. and they're told that they're normal. Yeah. Like, oh my goodness. This is so, it's like criminal. So we have to do free T3, free T4. Free T4, there's no real optimal range because I actually don't want free T4 too high. Mm -hmm. So I always say for free T4, if you're floating like between like a 0.8 and a 1.1, that's really nice. If it starts to go higher than that, then I start to worry about conversion, okay. which brings us to reverse T3. Yep. Reverse T3 tells us whether or not you are converting your inactive thyroid hormone T4 over to the active thyroid hormone T3. Because your cells, every cell on your in your body has a receptor site on it for thyroid hormone. Yeah. But it only has a receptor site for specifically T3. There are no receptor sites in our body for T4. And the reason why I say this and stress this is because going back to my story. Yeah. She I was going to ask that you. Was that yeah, you? She gave me T4. And turns out I don't convert at all. No. I do not convert T4 to T3. Mm -hmm. So her giving me T4, obviously it did nothing. I, I noticed nothing. There was not one pound lost. There was no energy gained, nothing. So T4 has to convert to T3 and it's a really hard job. So you can have a genetic snip like I do that prevents conversion. Yeah. If you're low in iodine, selenium, magnesium, if you're estrogen dominant, if you're insulin resistant, there are all these things that interfere with that conversion. So that's why we have to test reverse T3 because if you don't test it and see where you're at, you can actually get worse or your doctor can make you worse by giving you more T4 or even, incre even if you're on armor thyroid or NP thyroid, that's 80% T4. You have to know your reverse T3 because if you increase your dose on your NDT medication, that can make you worse as well. So you got to test reverse. And then like you said earlier, Maria, you have to test the antibodies, TPO and TGA antibodies. You have to test those. How can doctors not know this? I don't know. I know. That's like the million dollar question. Um, I really believe 
in, in talking to conventional docs that are kind of like a little bit more open-minded and, and at least verbal about this, what the answers they've given me are number one, that's all they've learned in med school is literally test TSH. If TSH is high, give T4, period. End of lesson. It's like a two second lesson for the master gland. It makes no sense. But that's what they're taught in med school. Um, you know, and they just, it, it really is a shame that they don't focus on it. I, I don't know whether it's the the incentives from big pharma, like, hey, a, a, an antidepressant sleeping pill, blood pressure medication and statin is going to make you more money, doc, than you prescribing generic liothyronine, yeah. <laughs> T3, generic T3. So I think there's there's a lot at, at play behind the scenes that, that we aren't even privy to. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I remember this was 20 years ago before I had kids and I went to the doctor and my husband lost his job and like our adoption fell through. I was super depressed and my doctor's like, you want to go on an antidepressant? I was like, no, there's, there's crap going on in my life right now. It's, it's okay to be sad sometimes, you know? Right. Right. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. They'll, ha they'll hand that out like candy yep. and you have to like crawl and beg for a, a little baby dose of T3. It's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. But I think that covers uh, Twyla's question. If TSH is optimal, but T3 is low and T4 is within range, how would you treat it? We kind of touched that on. Yeah, you, yeah, you still have to treat it because actually I've, I've gotten to the point, I will still test TSH just to look at it, but it's not important. TSH is really not important because TSH is a pituitary hormone. Mm. So you could have someone like myself, on T4 only for five months, and my TSH is going to go down. And in fact, it might even look optimal per functional medicine. It might go to a, a one. And I could still be, or I, I would still be hypo. Mm -hmm. And unless someone looks at my free T3 and then looks at how I'm converting my T4 to T3 by looking at my reverse, you're, you're never going to treat that person and get them to an optimized state where they feel good if you're only looking at TSH and basing it all off of that. That makes sense. But are there some like, I don't know, like white elephants in the room where their TSH is like at four and that's how they feel the best? I've never seen someone with a high TSH feel good. No, okay. no. I, I, I have someone that very one predominant in the keto community or she was in the past. And she's like, I feel my best when my TSH is like 4.5. And I was like, wow. Okay. Wow. I don't know. I don't know. Now the iodine, if she's taking iodine, iodine will push up your TSH just on, on paper. Okay. And that iodine can actually help with conversion. It helps with thyroid hormone production. Okay. So I'm wondering if she's taking iodine or supplementing with that if that's not giving her that little bit of a push in TSH, mm -hmm. but then when we look at her, her other thyroid lab values, those might be in line, but you know what? It all, it, it, it does all come down to how do you feel? True. I mean, those are, those are the most important words we can say to anybody, any client, any patient is how do you feel? Right. Right. Well, let's talk about iodine because I get a lot of people saying, well, my doctor said to never take it because I have Hashimoto's. What are your thoughts? You know, I mean, in, in our community, it's yep. so split. And really, I would say it's split. I used to say 50-50, but the more people I talk to, I really think it's more like a 70-30, where you have 30% of the functional integrative population saying, no, don't use iodine because it'll make you hyper or cause a thyroid storm. Mm -hmm. And then you have 70%, which I'm in that 70%, saying, no, use iodine because it's vital. Now, I look at things from a common sense logic point of view. So I look at biology first. Every cell in our body has a receptor site on it for iodine as well. Just like T3, it has a receptor site on it for iodine. Iodine is antiviral, antifungal, antibacterial. When we look at the periodic table of elements, iodine is part of a halide group. So chlorine, bromide, fluoride, those are toxic halides that are in the same category as iodine. So those receptor sites on our cells for iodine, guess what can bind to that particular receptor? Hmm. Fluoride, chlorine, 
bromide. Guess what you're exposed to every day? Well, hopefully not fluoride. Hopefully you've changed your fluoride toothpaste. Bromide, if you wear clothes, have carpet, have furniture, have grass, you have exposure to bromide. If you live near a golf course, you have a massive exposure. That's to bromide. I have a question about that. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, so yeah, you, you, you are being constantly exposed to these toxic halides mm -hmm. every day and they are very toxic to the thyroid. The only way to knock those off the receptor site is by taking iodine. So it's, it's vital. Iodine will lower reverse T3. It'll help with conversion. I mean, it just blows my mind. The people that say don't take it. I'm like, can you logically explain to me why? Mm -hmm. Because I can tell you why to take it. I would like to hear that opposing argument. And the only time I've ever heard of a thyroid storm happening is really you, if you would have a practitioner that told you, okay, Maria, you're just starting on iodine today. Here, take 50 milligrams right off the bat. Yes. I mean, yeah, you might be like, holy cow, like I'm, I'm losing my mind. I'm crawling out of my skin. Because you started too high. Like just back it down. Start with like two milligrams and work your way up or something like that. Just low and slow. Well, I heard you say a Herx reaction. And I know what that is because Craig's Lyme disease and stuff. But yep. can you tell people what a Herx reaction is if maybe they could experience that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a it's like a detox reaction. So you figure if if those toxic halides are competing at the cell level and and you are loaded down because you haven't been taking iodine and you've just been living your life as a human being exposed to these toxic halides, there's really there's not a whole lot you can do. Yes, a whole house water filtration system, changing your your toothpaste to fluoride free. But again, that bromide piece, we're just being constantly exposed. So in order to knock out those halides, you have to take iodine. So you start taking iodine and then all of a sudden, I mean, just, you could almost picture it in your mind. All of these toxic halides are getting pushed off the cell and entering your body. And if your detox pathways are not properly trained and opened up, then you could get that, that Herxheimer reaction where it's just that, and, and it can be different for anyone. I mean, some people will get, a, a skin rash. Some people will get a migraine. Some people will get body pains. I mean, I don't know what Craig experience is wow. with his line, but it can kind of be anything on the spectrum. Yeah. For him, it was pain. So yeah. Yeah. But it, it was like the sauna was making stuff release type thing. He's like, he can't do that anymore. I was like, well, let's just release all of it. <laughs> yep. But yeah, same thing. Detox, detoxing. It's, it's that detox that is beautiful and wonderful but if it happens too quickly and the body isn't quite ready for it, then you get that hurt. hurt oh, your yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. Well, what like chlorine. So I've worked with a lot of um, teenagers and they had this fatty liver and they're like, I don't drink alcohol, I swear. But they were on the swim team. They were lifeguards. Oh, Let's yeah. talk more about chlorine and how like liver, maybe how that's affecting our thyroid, too. Yeah, I mean, chlorine is like just a massive assault to the thyroid. So, just like yeah, swimming, swimming. I mean, you're 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 just bathing, and our skin is our largest organ. So you're just bathing in this toxic halide. And I get it. I mean, we got to have it in the pool so that it doesn't grow bacteria and fungi and all that. But but still, it's it's on our body. So anyone that is a swimmer, or if you have a hot tub. Oh my gosh. I mean, absolutely. You have to add in iodine because that, that at least gives you a fighting chance to protect your body as you're being exposed to these toxic halides. And of course the liver is a huge detox organ. Mm -hmm. So I guess it would, it, yeah, it would make sense that if someone is overloaded in toxins, they're not, the swimmers probably are not taking iodine if they're younger, of course, you know, they're not eating properly 100% of the time and the liver just gets bogged down. So we can see, you know, the toxins may be affecting their thyroid. The thyroid affects their insulin and glucose. We know that high insulin, high glucose contributes to fatty liver. Yeah. So it's just kind of a, a almost like a vicious cycle where we're lifestyle is feeding the fatty liver and then the thyroid being off is feeding the fatty liver it's just a mess. It's it a mess. Is a mess. Yeah. 
Well, what about like thyroid glandulars? I've seen that quite a bit. What do they benefit all the parts of the thyroid or what? So thyroid glandulars are incredibly beneficial, but we just have to, we have to test and not guess. It comes back to knowing your reverse T3. So for instance, if someone is on T4 only and you're listening to this and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm only taking Synthroid, I'm only taking Levo. Of course, I'm not getting better. This is horrible, but my doctor won't work with me, won't give me T3, won't put me on arm or thyroid, won't do anything except standard of care, like I experienced. I mean, number one, yeah, you can fire your doctor and get a new doctor. I mean, that's probably the best choice. But if you're a little bit stuck and you can't you know, move into the functional world just yet, then adding in a glandular is absolutely better than nothing because glandulars as much, and I have a podcast on this where I go into and explain it. I say, you know, glandular supplements are supposed to not contain T4 and T3, not contain thyroid hormone. But again, going back to my logical brain, I go, okay, wait, if we are drying out the thyroid gland of a cow, so mm -hmm. the pig thyroid gland is medication, cow thyroid gland is the glandulars that can be put in supplements. Yeah. If we're drying out the thyroid gland of a cow, is there a little guy picking <laughs> out the T4 and T3 from, no, it's the same thing as drying out the pig. The, yeah. the pig, the pig glandular, drying out a pig's thyroid gland, putting it into a capsule or a tablet, and selling it as a pharmaceutical is the yeah. same thing as drying out a cow's thyroid gland. So yes, you are getting T4 and T3 uh -huh. in it. So is that better than T4 only? Yes. But if you have a conversion problem, so if you are, and, and really T3 only people like myself, we're, we only make up about five to 10% of all hypothyroidism. So don't be listening to this and be like, I'm T3 only. Yeah. Now you probably aren't. But if you have a conversion problem, adding in a thyroid glandular is going to push up the T4 that you're taking in. Yeah. So my suggestion would be to, I mean, you can't do this on your own. You got to talk to your doctor before lowering or changing your medication. But my suggestion would be, how about we lower or take out the T4 only because it's not doing anything anyways. Right. And, and then use the glandular so you're getting a more balanced ratio of T4 okay. and T3. Makes sense. Makes total sense. Are there any supplements you should avoid when taking thyroid supplements? Thyroid medications, I should say? No, not really. Like, I mean, team, like I've heard you're supposed to take that at the different time. It, yeah, it's all about timing. So there's no supplements that I would say, oh my gosh, avoid these. I would say uh, thyroid people tend to overdo selenium because everybody talks about the benefits of selenium and selenium is great but we don't want to overdo it. Mm -hmm. So eating some Brazil nuts, taking maybe a hundred milligrams of selenium uh, every day, or just even a couple times a week, that's enough to support your selenium levels. Okay. Any supplement at all should be taken an hour away from your thyroid medication. So it doesn't bind to your thyroid medication. Mm -hmm. Iron has to be taken four hours away. Uh, you don't want to be doing like, I mean, you shouldn't be doing this anyways, but Tums, any kind of, you know, any of those PPIs or taking a calcium supplement, that should be four hours away from your thyroid medication. Just because you can bind to it. Okay. Yep. yep. Or any of the binders. Like if you're working on a detox protocol and you're using binders or activated charcoal, that should be four hours away as well. So I understand what would cause a person to have low iron or low ferritin, but can you explain how thyroid can affect your ferritin levels? Absolutely. So it, it, it goes both ways. So the thyroid gland can affect your iron balance and your ferritin levels, which is your iron stores. But then the opposite low ferritin can actually affect how mm -hmm. your thyroid, well, it, it more affects how you tolerate T3. So if I have someone that obviously they desperately need T3, they've been on T4 only, and we start them off on, let's say, five micrograms twice a day of T3, just a nice little baby starting dose to get them used to it. And they, oh my gosh, they're like, no way. I am hyper. I am anxious. I am jittery. I'm sweaty. I call it icky and sticky. So they get icky and sticky. And I go, man, that's such a low dose. And we look at their ferritin and that's in the toilet. 
then yeah. we okay so we need to build up your iron stores for you to be able to tolerate us increasing your t3 and normally when we build up that ferritin then the person's like oh okay now i can increase to 10 and 10 and 20 and 20 but until we and, and here's the other thing is that low ferritin mimics hypothyroid symptoms so with low ferritin you can be fatigued have weight gain have constipation lose your hair so a lot of times it's an it's an overlap as well okay well you're just kind of like bringing up all these other questions what about soy how does soy affect our thyroid or oh, does it yeah it's horrible it's it's horrible listen i don't care if you use some soy sauce if you're going out for sushi or something like that but you don't want to be doing soy protein and soy milk and edamame and tofu. And it just, soy will, number one, it is estrogenic. So, you know, you, you hear about phytoestrogen and you might be sitting there going, well, I'm eating non-GMO soy. Okay, I get it. I get it. But it still is estrogenic. So if you push yourself into an estrogen dominant state, which I literally did back in my 30s, when I kind of got on a little bit of a soy kick without knowing any better. And this is like 20 some years ago. Um, so I, I made myself estrogen dominant. So that is possible. I mean, men will start getting the man boobs and all of that, but soy directly impacts your thyroid because it's a goitrogen, meaning it can cause a goiter on your thyroid gland. And I've also seen it interfere with how thyroid medication is working too. So when I'm working with, with vegans and vegetarians, I try to convert them. Like yeah. I try to bring them over to our side, yeah, but <laughs> I really do try. But then I, I also hit them with like, okay, if you're going to stay on that side of the fence, you got to find other alternatives other than soy because you're tanking your own thyroid. Yeah. Well, that's the thing too. A lot of the medication is animal products. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it'd be pretty hard to be vegetarian or vegan. Um, but what about like, what foods are supporting to the thyroid? I think we all kind of, you and I probably know, but like, let's tell people like protein or what? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, protein is supportive to the whole body, mm -hmm. right? So if, if you are low in protein, it's going to start affecting your hair. I'm sure you see this with your women, right? I'm losing my hair. Well, how much protein are you eating? Like 50 grams. I'm like, well, well, because they've been told that the ketogenic diet is a 70%, which percentages will cause you to fail. That, yeah. that way, but they think too much protein turns into sugar, and then they're like, "But I'm losing my hair, and I my just yeah, my energy's bad." Yeah, right, right. I mean, protein really covers a lot of those hypothyroid symptoms and helps to improve them. And then the opposite is true: low protein intake will exacerbate all of those hypothyroid symptoms and make them worse. So protein is number one uh, across the board, protein intake. I am a huge fan of one gram per pound of lean body mass. I think that's easy, simple. It, it's easy math for people. I don't know, Maria, what do you tell your people for protein? That at least, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. I probably do, I mean, I'm not telling everybody to do this, but I probably do double my body, my body weight and protein. But mm -hmm. that's, I love it. Like, and I just feel best with it. I sleep better and everything. So I just, I, I go a little crazy with it, but. Yeah. I mean, that, that really is number one. And then outside of that, you know, healthy fats, I don't want my women avoiding fats, but to your point, you, some people entering the keto diet, they overemphasize the fat component and de-emphasize the protein component. And we kind of need to flip flop that, and, you know, it's protein first, but yeah, you still need your good healthy fats. Mm -hmm. um, and then honestly, beyond that, it's more of, of avoidance then. So what do we want to avoid if we have thyroid disease? Well, we want to, if you're going to do vegetables, if you're going to do the cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, you better make sure they are cooked well. Yeah. You know, you can't be a, a raw vegetarian and and think that your thyroid gland is going to function well it's just not because those are goitrogenic as well especially in their in their raw state um and then obviously the the big the big obvious ones of processed food oh. grains um gluten is an absolute must avoid because number one with any autoimmune condition we want to avoid gluten i mean really if you're if you're breathing right now and listening to this, you want to avoid gluten, mm -hmm. but specifically with the thyroid. And when I tell this way, I think it, it really drives the point home. If people can think about it. 
if you have Hashimoto's, which 95% of all hypothyroidism is Hashimoto's. Mm. So if you have Hashimoto's, then you have this group of soldiers that like to go out and they like to beat up your thyroid. So that's all autoimmune is. If you, if you break it down and think of autoimmune as you have these groups of soldiers and they like to go out and attack whatever their autoimmune label is. Rheumatoid arthritis is your joints. Uh, celiac is your small intestine villi. So it, Hashimoto's obviously is your thyroid. Those soldiers go out and they beat up your thyroid gland, causing it to not work like it should in its healthy state. Whenever we consume gluten, there's that the protein of gluten is gliadin. That gliadin molecule looks identical to the thyroid gland. It has something called molecular mimicry. Mm -hmm. So your soldiers that are trained to attack your thyroid gland because they think it's a bad guy. They're just confused. They think it's a bad guy. Those soldiers see that gliadin and go, hey, guys, there's a there's an invader coming in. I think we should launch a war because it's not cool. It's a bad guy coming in. Mm -hmm. So those soldiers go out to attack the gliadin molecule that they think is the thyroid gland. They just think it's another bad guy. And then naturally, they're going to move over and attack your thyroid gland too. So if you're consuming gluten every day, or if you're one of the, I hear, well, I'm mostly gluten-free. Oh, you're most, that's like being kind of pregnant. Totally thing. Right. Like, yeah. Are you kind of pregnant? You're mostly gluten-free. So every single exposure that you have to gluten is mm -hmm. causing an autoimmune attack. You might feel it. You might not feel it. Maybe you're like, oh, I just put on five pounds. Oh, I'm really tired for the last couple of days. That could just be your your thyroid gland literally being attacked. Yeah. Well, let's talk about like autoimmune thyroid. How come after giving birth, a lot of autoimmune thyroid problems happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, after giving birth and then after the age of 40 called thyropause. So any kind of hormonal shift can trigger an autoimmune disease. So when we look at that three-legged stool of autoimmunity, we have the genetic predisposition. We normally have leaky gut over here. And then we have a trigger. And that trigger, that trigger can be you know, gluten exposure. The gluten exposure can contribute to the leaky gut. But then that trigger can be hormonal shifts. And while pregnancy is a, is a natural process for women, it still is a massive hormonal shift time. I mean, your hormones are going crazy. And then think, you know, perimenopause and menopause, another hormonal shift. So it's very, very common for us to hear after pregnancy or really after the age of 35, 40, that's when symptoms just come out of the blue and they start appearing and the woman's body goes crazy. And that is that, that downregulation of the thyroid gland or autoimmunity actually presenting itself. It's that, that autoimmune switch turning to the on position. So it was in the off position, even though you had that genetic predisposition for autoimmune, that switch was still off. Mm -hmm. And then a trigger occurred and it flipped it on. Okay. I thought the immune system was circulating to protect the fetus, but I was must have been wrong. Oh yeah. No, no, that too. Oh yeah. No, you can add that in too. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. 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 You have alien in your body. I mean, yep. Yep. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And then the immune system is just like, whoa, what's happening? What's happening? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, that absolutely contributes as well. I know that zinc is really important for thyroid health, but I also don't think you should take zinc ongoing. Do you feel the same way? Yes, yes, right. yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, zinc is, is amazing for our immune system, thyroid health as well, um, testosterone production. But I, I'm, I am a huge fan of kind of cycling my supplements. So I have, I have my list of what I call the no duh supplements, like duh, of course you're going to take them every day. Right. There's, so that the no brainer ones, that's the vitamin D and the magnesium and iodine. Um, I've even added black cumin seed oil to that list because black cumin helps lower antibodies, lower inflammation. That is really? Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's amazing. It's I like cancer too. Eating primrose oil. Okay. Yeah. No, evening primrose is good too, but I would throw in some black cumin seed. They're different. Oh yeah. They're different. Totally okay. different. Yeah. Well, Nigella you know. sativa is black cumin. Okay. And this is one of the only, I mean, you know, the supplement world, you cannot say something 
prevents cancer no. unless you have a boatload of studies behind it or you're getting shut down by every alphabet soup agency there is. Yeah. But nigella sativa or black cumin seed oil has the studies behind it to be able to say it is a cancer yeah. preventative. Wow, because I know like I, I'm really into peptides and a lot of the peptides like that thymosin alpha one. Yeah, like that's banned because they said that it prevents COVID, right? So they totally <laughs> banned, they banned it because of that. Or like BPC one fifty seven is great yep. for pain, but that's also banned because it helps with you know like they said too much about it. Okay, I'm gonna look into that for sure. That's awesome. Yeah, no, it it it's it, it's part of it's definitely part of my no duh supplement list. No duh. But then all the others I kind of bring in and out. B vitamins, I'm pretty good about that every day. Okay. Um, but I even cycle those in and out. You know, I don't take them every single day. So zinc is is in that category of kind of bringing it in and out. So I love supplements. I've just seen them make such a difference in people's lives, even though they eat like the perfect diet, right? How, how do you feel about supplements, even though you know we're eating great healthy food. Yeah. You, you just, it, it, our soil is too depleted. Mm -hmm. It just is. You're, I mean, honestly here living in Iowa, right? So I drive down the street and farmers are cutting corn and soybeans left <laughs> and right right now. It's harvest season. And, you know, I, I brought this up. My, my husband actually brought this up. He goes, do you think that an organic farmer that is sandwiched in between all of these other farms using Roundup and using pesticides that I haven't even heard of before. Do you really think that the organic stuff isn't getting overspray? And I'm like, yeah, it, it is. I mean, at least it's it's not as bad as spraying it right on it and using like Roundup ready um, genetically modified seeds, yeah. but it's still getting some overspray. So as much as we try mm -hmm. and 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 try, I mean, at least if you can get it, give it eighty percent, that's that's winning. But as much as we try, we are not going to be able to consume enough nutrients, support our detox pathways from the pesticides that we are being exposed to, even if you eat organic. Yeah. We need supplementation to support our bodies. We just do. 100%. But on another point, I'm a bow hunter with a bow yeah, and arrow. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. I was sitting there in the stand. This was years ago. And I was like, yeah. Yeah. These are not grass fed animals anymore because there's a soybean field over here. There's corn over here. You know, they're not, they're not grass fed animals anymore. No, no. My husband brought that up too. Cause he got me into, into hunting. Oh so God, here, you know, you. in Iowa, big, big yeah. deer. So you're welcome to come. I love, I, that's awesome. No, I hunt right out there and I, um, you know, I'm getting ready for the rut. So yeah, I, I was actually it. supposed to be moose hunting right now in yeah. Canada. Oh, that's a bucket list. But Moose and Alec is a bucket list. It is a bucket list. I helped um, a woman. I don't. There was a TV show that we did called Reversed, and she was a type two diabetic that was very thin. She was skinny fat, right? She mm -hmm. needed to gain more muscle and shrink the fat cells. And she lived up in Saskatchewan, and she invited me to hunt. But my husband's like, "You are gone like every week. Please just stay here for a little bit." So uh, yeah, I'll go maybe next year. So there you go. Yeah, but get out there. Yeah, get, definitely get some get some deer hunting in. But you're right that they are they they are no longer grass fed. I mean, we are getting literally some pesticides and 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 Monsanto GMO seeds in our deer meat. We just are. Okay, so I, I didn't know if I should bring this up or not, but I've heard you say to add in carbs once or twice a week to help with T3. However, Dr. Finney, who's like the keto king, mm -hmm. said that, yes, if you've been ketogenic for a long period of time, and for me, it's like 27 years, your, your thyroid becomes more efficient. So that T3 looks lower, but it's because it's more efficient. Yeah, yeah. You know, so let me, yeah, let me clarify. So when I built Keto for the Week, I built it for my people that, I mean, you know, when you're transitioning them from oh, yeah. being a, a, a sugar burner to mm -hmm. being a fat burner, it's kind of a hard transition to bring them into, into okay. Keto. So I said, okay, we're going to not give them a cheat day for God's sake, but, but give them one day. And actually, I have them get into ketosis first. So it okay. might be four to eight weeks before yeah. they're allowed to have this, this higher carb day. 
Yeah. Four to eight weeks in ketosis. And then let's give them that, that nice. one day yeah. per week, right? Oh. So that they can have something to look forward to and get into it. But to your point, here's the other thing. When you are actually being treated properly and my patient population, obviously 99% of them need thyroid yeah. medication because that's why they're coming to me because they're not getting it, getting proper treatment elsewhere. They, we, we have their thyroids covered. So if they want to be carnivore, if they want to be keto, it's not going to affect their T3 levels because we're supplementing that. We're mm -hmm. optimizing them anyways with the right thyroid hormone. Mm -hmm. But people in the, in maybe that aren't my patients, but they just want to get healthier and become that, that ketogenic fat burner. Yeah. That's where I say, okay, once you're in ketosis, now once a week, just throw in like a sweet potato, bring up your carbs, have some berries, have some honey and, and allow your thyroid gland to go, whoa, okay, I'm going to push up some T3 and then you can come right back down into ketosis. Okay. Okay. So you don't necessarily think it's becoming more efficient? Well, that that's interesting. I would have to look into Dr. Finney's I'll send it to you. work. The yeah, send it to me. yeah. Cause yeah. that's just, um, that was just what I would send people when they're saying that my T3 is getting worse. It's like, and again, most people don't stick with it. So I think that's your point too, is adding it in because you're not looking at doing it for 20 years. You're looking to do it for, you know, time to get some weight off. Maybe, I don't know. Oh, well, I mean, I'm hoping they'll make it a lifestyle because, I hope so. you know, and I mean, I know you get this question too. Like I am, I am low carb. I mean, that's my lifestyle. That's how I, I will always be. And I feel better. I'm healthier. Like that is, that is my lifestyle. So if it can become a lifestyle, I mean, the, really the hope is, is that people get into it. And even on that higher carb day, they go, yeah, I don't really like that that much. Yeah. So, I mean, the people that need it for their mental capacity to be able to get back into a ketogenic lifestyle through the week and then have that one day because they are socializing, they have work functions, whatever, that's fine. But the hope is, is that maybe you don't really feel that good on that high day and yeah. you get right back into it. I mean, I'm like you, I've been, I mean, have I, okay, have I come out of it here and there and had my sweet potato fries or my downfall? Well, I'm, so I'm not a judge. I just got back from Italy. I did a keto retreat in Italy. Yeah. And um, some of them were like strict carnivores usually, but they're like, I'm in Naples, the place that invented <laughs> pizza. And I was like, do your thing. And they got it. And I was like, how was it? They're like, totally not worth it. No, yeah. Like, I feel like garbage, but right. Yeah, yeah. Like Their joints hurt. And they said it really wasn't that great of a food. You know, I think, but once you change your palate and stuff, it's just, yeah, it's just different. But yeah, I, I don't even use like sweeteners anymore. Like I used to, you know, I started off using um, maybe a little bit of stevia or, or xylitol or allula. My palate's changed so much that I don't even use those anymore. And it just takes time. I mean, uh, I think it's like 14 days to turn over your taste buds. So, but most people don't give themselves that much time. Right. But, well, Dr. Amy, I don't want to take up any more time. What, where can people find you if they need some help? I, this has been amazing. Thank you for having me on. Um, they can find me at dramie.com, D-R-A-M-I-E.com. On there, we have a place to book a call if you want to talk more about your health situation. And we prescribed all 50 states. So we got you covered in With the Canada? thyroid and the and the hormone. Canada level. too? No. What's that? Canada yeah. too? Yeah. Parts of Canada. Yes, Canada. absolutely. Yep. Yeah. All 50 states. I would say most of Canada, some of the smaller areas we don't, but most of Canada we do. Right. And then you can find me on the Thyroid Fixer podcast. We have almost 460 episodes now, so you can dive into all of that as well. And then the Fixer supplement line with the Thyroid Fixer and Metabolism Fixer that Maria talked about, that is also linked to my site. And you can also go to betterlifedoctor.com and find those. I love it. I have to tell you, I learned so much. Thank you so much for your time. This has yeah, been my great. My and pleasure. maybe we'll have to go some moose hunting next year. Oh my gosh, I think so. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna have to give me details on that. I'll go with you. It's awesome. Thanks everybody for watching and make sure to uh, share this video with your friends because everybody, they deserve to feel great. When I was 16 years old, I was diagnosed with PCOS, acid reflux, depression, and IBS. Instead of taking those prescription drugs, I decided to change my life with food.
Yes, food healed me and has healed so many of my clients over the past 20 years of working with people. If you are interested in transforming your life, check out ketomaria.com. I'd be honored to help you.